step into our sermon time uh, this morning and encourage you to pull your Bibles out. I'd love for you to be looking at Ephesians 4 along with me as we continue in our series in the book of Ephesians. Uh, let me say a word of welcome to those joining us over in the chapel as well as we are gathering here enjoying the more, shall we say, current or latest expressions of worship. Our friends in the chapel are enjoying the more classic or traditional language of worship. But when we come to God's word together, we all try to speak the same language <laughs> and uh, be clear together on that. Uh, okay, I, I got to just share this per just personal moment with the pastor. Um, so <laughs> this has happened a couple times. Uh, I probably shouldn't share this with you, but um, has, has this ever happened to you when, you're, when we're taking communion and we, and we take that dry cracker? And then, well, you've never had this happen maybe, but you try to talk, you should try it sometime. You should try to eat, eat that little dry cracker and then try to talk. And uh, today I have one right here. And uh, I, was, I thought I was gonna make all sorts of really strange noises. But uh, so, you know, real, just keeping it real. That doesn't happen to you. You're looking at me like, you are one strange dude. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Welcome back, Included. Included series. Here's what we're talking about in this, and particularly if you are, uh, haven't been with us uh, throughout this series, let me just uh, kind of catch you up. We've been, we've been stepping through the book of Ephesians where Paul literally takes the first three chapters of Ephesians, and he tries to help us understand that when uh, we place our trust and faith in Jesus, in his death and resurrection. We are supernaturally joined to Christ, giving us a new spiritual standing. Okay, this is, this is largely what chapters 1 to 3 were about as we stepped through those together. We're now, Paul says repeatedly in his letters, we are now included in Christ. Okay? We're included in Christ. We've been joined to him, and now we have a new standing with him. We're included. God has blessed us, Paul says, with every spiritual blessing that we need. He says we've, he've, he's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Uh, well, what does that mean? Things like our sins have been forgiven. Our lives have been, shall we say, bought back out of slavery to sin. In other words, we've been redeemed. We have been given the promised Holy Spirit to journey with us and empower us and guide us. We've been made alive spiritually. Remember, we talked about being made alive spiritually where now we start to care about what God cares about. So we're alive spiritually. He also says we were raised with Christ. We were seated with him. I mean, we're included all the way through, friends. Seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Okay? Our lives, in other words, are now securely included in Christ. We, we celebrate this as a church family together when we celebrate communion. These are the blessings and the benefits we celebrate each time we take the bread and the cup and we celebrate communion together. We're thanking God in a focused way because now now, because of him, not us, we're positioned securely in Christ. Ah, right? Now, here's what I want to flesh out uh, in more detail today. This new standing in Christ positions us to walk in him. This new standing positions us and enables us to, to walk in him and really to live freely of live free rather from destructive habits and hang-ups we're now in other words we're now able to learn we have all the resources all the, all the resources we need to learn to live in ways the creator designed us to live in christ we are actually positioned to thrive in life to experience joy and express our best selves to one another. 
Today, we're going to explore the calling and the empowerment for growing up into all that God designed you to be. We're going to talk about change. We're going to talk about how change and growth can happen in your life. You see, Our becoming a Christian and being a Christian is not simply a kind of a one prayer or one decision issue. It's not simply about being transformed on the inside and and having a hope that someday when we get to heaven, it's all, I'm going to be a better person. Our Christian faith is not just a future thing. We We don't just accept Christ and then grin and bear it till we get to heaven. Okay? Being a Christian involves daily choices to follow the way of Jesus and daily choices to cooperate moment by moment with the Spirit. The transformation that God brings into our lives doesn't just happen internally. He empowers us with everything we need so that that internal transformation now begins to be lived out. That transformation enables us to begin to experience, actually experience in this life, the blessings of the rule and reign of God in our life. We don't have to wait till we're in heaven to enjoy the, the presence and the power and the, and the blessing of God in our lives. Are you with me? Now, more fully there, I get it. Unadulterated by sin there, I get it. But today, there's still a taste of it, okay? Remember last week, Paul used the phrase, joined and fitted together. It's a phrase I I shared with you. It's a phrase that uh, is related to the idea of setting bones that have been broken or or, uh, dislocated. And the idea is that there is healing and realignment that needs to happen in our lives so that they are aligned, our lives are aligned with God's heart and will. As our creator, I don't know if you've thought about this, but as our creator, he knows best how we can thrive in our lives. So he reveals truth to us, right? He reveals truth to us in his word. Then he works to metabolize that truth out of our brains and into our lives through his spirit. But but this is not some sort of robotic takeover. It's not some sort of robotic takeover. Each of us are to cooperate as best we can with that alignment or transformation effort. We are to say, to say yes to the Spirit's leading and promptings in our lives and not stiff arm them, okay? Think about it this way. When we become a Christian, we are placed in Christ and set apart as God's holy possession, okay? We're included. We've been talking about that. This is our new standing in Christ, Then the Holy Spirit sets about the process of transforming us to align your actual behavior, your actual attitudes, your actual speech to be more and more aligned with God in our day-to-day lives. And the more we embrace this, just, just motivation to listen, I think, the more we embrace this and allow it to shape us, the more joy the more satisfaction, the more meaning. It doesn't mean you're not gonna have hard, li- not hard things in life, but it means you're gonna, you're gonna have the resources and the, and the purpose and the context and the worldview to process all that properly, see? So the more we embrace this and allow it to shape us, the more joy and satisfaction and meaning and all that we enjoy in life because we're living in greater and greater alignment with how our creator designed us to be. Make sense? Yeah. So today, our text addresses this in- external or, or behavior makeover, this greater alignment with how God made us. Paul basically ar- argues, listen, you will gradually become a better version of yourself after you become a Christian and begin to grow as God designed you to live. You'll become a better version of yourself. So if you think you're good now, as you align more and more with God, even better, okay? Better version of yourself. Look at verse 17 to 24. Let's, let's look at the first half of our chunk today, 17 to 24. So Paul says, I tell you this, and now notice, I insist on it in the Lord, okay? A lot of emphasis here. I insist on it in the Lord. This is not an option. Not, this is not optional living. I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. 
They are darkened in their understanding. They are separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Why? Due to the hardening of their hearts towards God. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. It's sort of a downward spiral. Okay? Now let's pause there for a second. Basically, those verses are a disturbing description of a person's life that is not included in Christ. A person's life who is not included in Christ, not connected to God or not al- and not aligned with him. Now, now notice, these are serious words. Their thinking is futile. Their thinking is futile. In other words, it's vain, empty. It, it, it goes nowhere. It's to no purpose. In other words, it's futile to think that you know better how to live than your creator does. It's futile to think that you can ignore God and never take Jesus seriously in your life. That's, the Bible calls that futile thinking. When something is futile, it means that no matter how sincere you are, no matter how well-meaning you are, no matter how smart you are or how old you are or how hard you try, it's never going to get any better or change because you don't have the correct information or knowledge. You're, you don't, you are not connected with God. Now notice, when you don't have all of the information you need, in other words, you don't, you don't have the truth that you need, Paul says your understanding is impacted. Your understanding is impacted. He says, he says their understanding's darkened. Why? Literally, because they are unable to perceive, they're unable to understand. This is the condition of every person not connected with God. They live in a kind of spiritual darkness, unaware of their dire situation. They're unaware and and, 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 and often not bothered by it. Why? Because they're separated from God. Not because he doesn't love them or isn't drawing them to himself. It's not because he doesn't approve of them. They're, not, they're, they're separated from God because they have hardened their hearts towards him. That's, that's Paul's description. The language alludes to an alienation from God that uh, over time uh, creates a callousness on your heart to where you're, there's a kind of a lack of sensitivity to God's presence and leading. And the hardness of heart keeps them ignorant of how God thinks about them and feels towards them and what he has done for them. It doesn't sink in. See? Their futile thinking, darkened understanding, their ignorance of God, God's ways, dulls their sensitivities. It dulls their sensitivities, their common sense. So, Paul says, those disconnected from God are left basically to pursue their natural urges, their sexual appetites, or whatever they believe in their darkened understanding will fulfill their needs. Whatever they think will make life work, that's what they're chasing after to quench their thirst, satisfy their cravings. And you see, Paul's saying all of this is futile because they're locked in a kind of vicious cycle. When you stop to think about it, they're locked in a vicious cycle. They're separated from God, locked into their own limited, finite human reasoning, which darkens their understanding, which causes them to make more and more poor choices, which takes them further and further away from God, darkening their understanding more. You see that? You see the down, that's the that's the sense you get when you read the scriptures. It's just go, it's just going down into a vortex. Now. I recognize that there may be some of you in the room who are recognizing as I'm talking about this, you're sitting there going, hold on, I'm not, I'm not connected to God. I'm, he's describing me. That text is describing me. Maybe, maybe you're sitting in the room today going, I, I'm not included. Well, remember where we started in the message. How do you become included? You place your faith and trust into the Lord Jesus, his death and his resurrection, and you believe that he did it for you. 
And when you place your trust and faith in him and recognize that he's wrapping you in his righteousness, not your perfection, that's what qualifies you for heaven. You're included, right? And so Paul's saying, you don't need to live like you've always lived. Change is possible. See? So don't so if that describes you, don't don't lose heart. Let's let's continue. Paul in, pleads with these included ones, and again, I've just explained to you how to become included if you're not. And he insists that they not allow themselves to continue in that destructive dysfunctional way of living. Look at verse 20. He says that's that's not the way of life you learned. So if you're newer to Foothill Church and you start coming, you, you, don't, you realize you're not included, but, but today you give your life to him and then you, you come back to, uh, week after week or you can go to a small group, you'll, you start to learn a new way of living. Again, that, that, will, that will produce the, be- the best version of yourself because it's how God created you to be. Make sense? Notice, this is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that's in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, the exciting truth about these verses for all of us is that being included in Christ means personal growth is possible. Yay? There might be some spouses in the room that are excited. There might be some parents in the room that have renewed hope for their kid. It might be kids going, maybe they'll get it this time. You know, change is possible. Yay? Who is glad they're not stuck with themselves in your current condition? I am. I'm one. I'm glad that there's hope that I can change. So that's what the verse is saying. In other words, Where there are ways of being, ways of living, uh, ways of relating in your life that are no longer helpful or constructive or God-honoring, you can change. When there are ways of relating and ways of living that regularly bring pain in your life. You ever ever notice that you keep on doing the same thing and and you keep you keep having these kind of broken relationship or pain or, or conflict or whatever, if there are ways of relating in your thinking, your acting, your speaking that, that continue to bring pain in your life, the, the beauty of these verses are you can change. You can grow. The old self as it's used here in the text refers to that way of living, Paul says, that's corrupted by deceitful desires. In other words, that's a way of living that's informed only by the culture, maybe, or informed only by your hurts, habits, and hangups. You're driven by natural desires. That's the old self. The new self refers to the way of living that is being made new in the attitude of your minds. In other words, you're learning, you're learning new information. You're learning a new way of living. You're beginning to practice that, and, and you're being transformed to be more and more like God. See, the transformation that Jesus brings internally is meant to to give way to a transformation externally in our lives. In Barna's research, most of you may are familiar with Barna, does research in all sorts of fields. Uh, In Barna's research with Christians, he found that the notion of personal holiness has slipped out of the consciousness of the vast majority of Christians. Only one-third... One third of Christians believe that God expects people to become holy. In other words, only one third of people who are included in Christ believe that God actually wants them to grow, to to look, live, love more like Jesus. Only one third. In another study, Barna learned that only half of all Christians said that they had been greatly transformed by their faith. The other half said that while their faith has been somewhat helpful in their lives, it it has not produced significant transformation or made much of a difference in their life. So half have gone, well, I haven't really noticed a lot of change. But the Bible insists, Paul, he, he says, I insist on this, that being a Christian involves not just an internal transformation, but an external transformation that flows out of the internal change. 
In our text, Paul insists on changed lives. He makes himself clear to the Ephesians, don't continue to live like you used to live. They're futile, that's futile thinking. It's darkened understanding. It's a, it's a life separated from God. Those, those guys are dead men walking. That's not you. That's not you. Christians are not to live that way. We are to put off old ways of living and put on new ways of living. After uh, 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 minds that are being renewed, we're understanding more, we're being more clear in our thinking, we're informed by the scriptures, and, and that new way of living, we begin to practice that and put that on. This is why the scripture says repeatedly this phrase, clothe yourselves with... And then a list of virtue. Clothe yourselves with humility. Clothe yourselves with compassion. See, it's a wardrobe language. This is what what Paul is using. It's a lifestyle wardrobe change. Change internally giving way to change externally. Now, in verses 22 to 24 there, you see in your text, those, that basically describes the fundamental process a person like you and me what we need to, the process we need to walk through in order to experience change in our lives, verses 22 to 24. And what's fascinating is that much of the personal growth and transformation literature and research today aligns directly, uh, sacred and secular research, you should know, aligns with Paul's roadmap for change. Isn't that fascinating? I love that. When the best and the smartest and the brightest do research today, and then they arrive to where the theologians have been for centuries. I love that. So in case you might be thinking that all this is you know, kind of a spiritual mumble jumbo, not really applicable to real life or your real life, you need to know many different change theories and even, even the new brain Science, which speaks of retraining your brain and creating new neural pathways that generate new attitudes and actions, all integrate and align with what the Apostle Paul wrote 2,000 years ago. Isn't that awesome? Ah, All right. Fundamentally, the components of change, I just just want to share this with you briefly, just so you you can kind of get a sense for it because I think it will resonate with you. Fundamentally, the, uh, the theories basically break down the process of change into six key components. You won't get lost in this, trust me. Number one, new information. You learn something new, you realize something new, you have a new insight, that's where change starts. Here's here's how it happens. Because you learn that new insight, you learn that new piece of truth, you learn that new reality, suddenly there's there's a dissonance inside of you. There's a conflict inside of you. That creates an internal restlessness. All right, we use words to describe this like uh, I- internal conflict, conviction. We feel convicted. There's a you realize something's misaligned, right? That's because you've learned something new at a, out of the Bible when you're reading it, or at a small group, or on one of these life changing sermons that I share with you. <laughs> so you learn something new. You have this internal kind of angst that happens. Now that internal angst drives you to find a way to restore peace in your soul, to get rid of the dissonance, to get rid of the angst, to get rid of the the, the conflict, the internal conflict, right? So you got a new piece of information, it's like something's amiss. Now you're like, I I gotta change something. Now here's where we're at risk. You can get to this point where you're feeling this angst and, and I want you to know that's, that's the, 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 the work in you that is, that is propelling you to change. But here's what we do sometimes. We numb that out. We, we self-medicate that out. We entertain that out. We shop that out. We eat that out. We drink that out. We whatever. We, 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 we numb that. Because we're trying, to, we're trying to gain a sense of peace internally. James Loder, author of the book of The Transforming Moment, insists... The inner drive towards consistency and resolution of dissonance is a persistent force in the psychic of life. In other words, there's something, we've learned something new, now we realize our lives are out of alignment, and now we either need to find, make a change to fix that, 
or, we're, or, we, or we numb out. I can't uh, caution you enough about being careful about numbing out. There's too much at stake here in your life and in your health and in your peace and in your family, etc. The stakes are too high. We have to be willing to push through some measure of short-term discomfort in order to try, find true joy, to find the change that is healthy, that's divinely given. Does that make sense? Biblically uh, guided, because it falls in alignment with who we are as created beings, to live like God calls us to live. That, that, will, that kind of change will sustain you and be healthy. But if, if we don't push through that discomfort at all, we just, we'll just stay stuck, right? Because it'll be a cycle. Feel the angst, numb it out. Feel the angst, numb it out. Feel the angst, find something new to numb it out. And we never really grow. When I was, uh, when I was 17, I got chicken pox. You're like, did he just lose his train of thought? <laughs> You're like, why are we talking about this right now? I, there's a point. I was 17 when I got chicken pox. Let me tell you, that's... Uh, that's not fun. It's never fun to have chicken pox. But when you get them as a sort of, well, young adultish person, anybody else get them late? Yeah, not fun, right? I remember, I remember, f first of all, feeling super cruddy, laying on the couch, and it was in the summer when I got them. And I was raised in Ohio. So it's hot, humid, and I'm crazy with itch. And I remember my mom sitting there going, Brian, <laughs> you can't scratch those pox. And everything in me wanted to just dig in. You with me? I'm gonna scratch the itch. Just gonna scratch the itch. She said, if you scratch, if you scratch that pox, you will have scars for life. Right? So I tested it. <laughs> On one right here where I would usually wear a shirt. Oh, sure enough, scar. <laughs> Friends, if we're not willing to, to fight back the urge to scratch the itches of our cravings or our our, our natural sort of yearnings or, or itches. If we're not willing to try to push back that uh, urge and push that off and find a way to relieve that in a healthy, God-given way, it will lead to scars. It will lead to scars. So the change there is say you've got this new information that's creating an angst in you, you, you don't numb out. Instead, find a solution. So we're moved to explore solutions uh, with spirit-given insight and, and biblically informed and, 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 and spiritual counselors and all the rest. We we're, we're explore solutions. And when an insight is gained and a solution is identified, then energy is released inside of the person, inside you to engage in change. You begin to practice something. Different. This is what Paul's talking about when he's saying, put on the new self. See, try that on. Put that on. Begin to wear that new attitude, that new behavior, that new speech, uh, that new mindset. Begin to practice it. Then the, the final uh, point in change is after we practice it, we've, we sort of internally evaluate and assess whether that change is actually working or not. Is it, 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 have I restored peace inside, right? And if we found, if we found God's way, then the Bible tells us that's when we, we find that peace, right? I share all this with you so that you're aware that what Paul is describing to us and encouraging us in is supported by those who study and research change theory even today with the latest research, the latest science of how change takes place. With the Holy Spirit superintending it all, with the Holy Spirit superintending it all, change involves the renewing of our mind. We have new information, new knowledge, Secondly, it involves awareness of that misalignment, self-awareness. There's something off in me, something I need to course correct. 
And then it involves action, putting off of an old, outdated way of living and putting on, replacing it with a new behavior. Putting on, putting off. Now, uh, I, there's a, th- this language is all the way through the scriptures, primarily in the New Testament. Um, I, I've got a number of scriptures here, but I, I just want to, I only want to point out a couple of them just for, just for time, okay? So let me, let me show you a fi, uh, Philippians chapter 2. This is a classic one because it puts both of these concepts together. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is a familiar verse to many of you. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purposes. Two English words work there, two separate words in the original. The first work refers to our right choices, our our intentional living, our decisions to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. The effort that we're putting in, the thought we're putting in, the energy we're putting in, that's, that's the first work. The second work refers to God's power for right choices. He's the one that empowers that in us. So each of these passages speak to the fact that God desires and empowers this transformation and you and I are to cooperate with it by making choices to align with it, saying yes to godliness. One last one, Romans 12. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Notice verse 2. Do not conform any longer. This, this, this is Paul. This is Paul theology right here. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Remember he said, I insist on it. You can't live like the, those disconnected from God. Don't need to. Don't need to. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of the world. You don't need to. But instead be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. Remember, where did the change process start? Knowledge. Understanding. Learning, understanding, gaining new insight. That's where it all changes. Realize something's wrong inside, misalignment. You gotta seek a solution. You don't numb out, you seek a solution. You push through, you practice, you put on, you put on, and the first time you get it right one out of six times. And then a few weeks later, you get it right two out of six times. And then pretty soon, you're like four out of six. And then pretty soon, that becomes your way of living. See how it works? Gradual. Guys, it's incredibly good news. Christian life, by definition, the Christian life, by definition, means change and growth is possible. It enables and empowers a behavioral wardrobe change, an attitudinal wardrobe change. The transformation Jesus brings is into you internally is to be lived out externally. So I have a few questions to leave with you, you with to reflect. And maybe you want to, I think I wrote these down. Did I include these in your notes? Okay, perfect. So um, you want to take these with you, reflect on these, and if you're in a small group, I would, if, you, if you're comfortable enough for your small group, you should process through some of these. What's God teaching you and working on in you? What is, what, in this season, usually God works on, a, a, on one behavior or an attitude, and one piece of you know, wardrobe or clothing change at a time, is do you have a sense for what he might be working on you? And I love the song, even when we're not aware, he's working. <laughs> When we tune into that, what, is, what, what might he be working on in you? What's your sense for what he's working on now in your life? One way to uh, put your finger on this is to ask yourself, where is the dissonance or conflict in me? Where, where do I feel misaligned internally? A lack of peace. See? See? If you had to write down one attitude or behavior or way of thinking that God is nudging you to put off, what do you think it would be? You know, as they've been kind of tapping on you to go, time to put that off. You don't need to live that way any longer. You don't need to have that attitude. You don't need to talk to your spouse that way. You don't need to run your business that way. You, what, whatever. Is there something he's asking you to put off? What, what might he be asking you to put on? These are, these are really good questions to reflect if you if you. If you're, if you're not, you don't have any sense for that, take, try to get some silence and solitude early in the week and try to, try to get a sense for that. Um, if, if you still come up blank, come back next week. 
Well, come back next week anyway. But if you still are a little blank, next week we're actually moving into the next section. If you want to read ahead where Paul starts giving us some ideas about (laughs) what we could put off and what we could put on. All right? Okay. Thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. Let's pray. (laughs) Lord, you're good to us. Um, Thank you for your truth. I want to pray particularly for those in the room today who might be realizing for the first time that they, they are not connected to you, Lord God. They have not placed their faith in Jesus. They've not crossed that line of kind of trusting you, Lord Jesus, and your death and resurrection. But today, they're feeling it very clearly. Thank you for hearing their hearts as they call out to you as their forgiver, as their leader, confessing their sin to you, asking you to include them in Christ. Lord God, thank you for hearing their prayers. And thank you for the ways that you resource us once we're included in you. You bless us with every, every tool we need. And so we ask you, as this text has been encouraging us, insisting in us, that we lean into you and cooperate with you in an ongoing way more and more and more each day. It's good to be in your word together, Lord God. It's good to worship you together. And it's good today to finish our time through this amazing practice of bringing back to you just a portion of the wealth that you've given us and allowed us to have. You've called us to be faithful stewards and to honor you with our wealth, to put you first, and to bring back a portion of what you've blessed us with. So we do that in this worship through giving. Bless each gift and each giver. It is such a joy, Lord God, to walk... (laughs) Uh, free from materialism and in full stride of who you've designed us to be. So bless us, Lord God, and may you be blessed with these gifts in your name. Hi, I'm Carrie Kinnicks, your children's ministry director here at Foothills Church. And here's what we have going on this week. If you're interested in becoming a member or you'd like to learn more about Foothills Church, please join Pastor Brian at our next orientation class on February 9th from 1 to 4 p.m. To register, contact Nicole at the church office or by email. Believe it or not, Kids Ministry is already preparing for this year's Easter Blast. 7,000 eggs will be stuffed with treats starting in March, which means we need loads of non-melting candy by the end of February. Grab a flyer at one of the bright yellow collection bins for more info and details about the specific types of candy needed. One Sunday each month, we take a moment to highlight our benevolent ministries, which helps our people in need. When we worship through giving today, remember to give to the Benevolent Fund to help this important ministry. Have you checked out the Foothills app yet? You can find Foothills Monthly, read the church blogs, watch sermons, sync events to your calendar, and even do fill-in or freehand notes. Just search Foothills CP in the iTunes or the Google Play Store. Are you new with us today? Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Would you do us a favor and fill out the green Connect card in the chair pocket in front of you? You can take it to the welcome booth out front after service. We have a special gift we'd love to give to you as our thanks for visiting us today. And don't forget to silence these and have a great Sunday and we'll see you on the patio.